An understanding of the mechanism of a chemical reaction, the sequence of elementary steps by which it occurs, is extremely valuable information for chemists for a number of reasons. On the one hand, reaction mechanisms are just interesting from an academic or intellectual point of view, since they give us details about how molecules behave on a submicroscopic level. But on the other hand, reaction mechanisms have a number of practical applications as well. One of the most important is involved in the generalization of a chemical reaction to new substrates or different types of molecules. If we know how a reaction mechanism works in general, we can predict how structural changes within a starting material can lead to changes in the rates or equilibrium properties of a chemical reaction as a whole. Additionally, we can design species that can accelerate chemical reactions called catalysts rationally using information about how reaction mechanisms work. And biologically, we can understand how biological catalysts like enzymes accomplish their work through a detailed understanding of reaction mechanisms. Over the next several lessons, we're going to develop facility in drawing organic reaction mechanisms involving the flow of two electrons at a time, so-called polar organic reaction mechanisms. We're not only going to look at these in a bookkeeping sense of where electrons move in reaction mechanisms, but also understand how these relate to interactions between localized molecular orbitals within molecules. And then we're going to transition to reasoning about reaction mechanisms and making reasonable predictions of how reaction mechanisms occur given reactants and products or even given reactants only. And then we're going to talk about catalysis, which is an extremely important application of reaction mechanisms that involves the use of species in substoichiometric or less than a full equivalent amount to accelerate chemical reactions through the lowering of transition state and activation energies. Finally, I would just argue that thinking mechanistically is in a pragmatic or practical sense the most efficient and effective strategy for learning new organic reactions. It allows us to do things like reason by analogy from a reaction we've seen before to a new organic reaction by identifying mechanistic similarities between the two reactions. These will often be buried under the surface, and we've talked about this idea before, that the deep connections between organic reactions sometimes won't be made explicit. The good news is that the deep connections are limited in their types. We'll see a limited number of elementary steps of polar reaction mechanisms in this unit. And if you can recognize those deep connections, you can really make learning organic chemistry a lot easier. To begin thinking about reaction mechanisms, we're going to start in a relatively simple context, that of acid-base chemistry. Acid-base chemistry is a relatively simple context to start in for two reasons. The first is that electron flows involved are relatively straightforward, and so there isn't a lot of complicated thinking we need to do about how electrons move in these reactions. The second is that they're generally extremely rapid, and this means that they're governed by the principles of chemical equilibrium, since with respect to other elementary steps or for acid-base reactions as a whole, we can always consider them as being in chemical equilibrium. Because of the importance of equilibrium ideas to acid-base reactions, which appear throughout organic reactions and mechanisms, let's review the principles of equilibrium in this first series of videos. We're going to start by developing a molecular level model of chemical equilibrium, essentially answering the question, what is it that molecules are doing when a process such as the conversion of a reactant A into a product B is in equilibrium? We define chemical equilibrium as a dynamic state in which the rate of a forward step or series of steps is equal to the rate of the reverse step. And this equation of the forward and reverse processes is the hallmark of chemical equilibrium. This equation doesn't mean both rates are zero, which is why we refer to this state as dynamic. And as far as a molecular level view or model is concerned, this simulation does a really nice job of showing us how this works. If we start with 100 molecules in chamber A, and heat the system up so that the kinetics of the reaction represented by the barrier between A and B is essentially irrelevant, eventually we'll reach a state where the concentrations or the numbers of molecules in this case of A and B are equal. And here we're thinking about A and B as the reactants and products of a chemical reaction or elementary step. Notice now that we've essentially reached a steady state where the number of molecules of A and B are fluctuating somewhat, but we consistently have more B molecules than A molecules, 
And for every B molecule that moves from right to left, from red to green, we have an A molecule moving from left to right. And this is what keeps the numbers of A and B molecules relatively stable. The vertical axis in this simulation is free energy, G. And in addition to showing us how equilibrium amounts to equal rates of the forward and reverse processes, as we just discussed, it shows us also that there's a relationship between the free energy difference between A and B and the numbers of A and B particles at equilibrium. Specifically because the delta G for this process is less than zero, as evidenced by the fact that the B well is lower in energy than the A well within the chamber, we can conclude that the concentration or number of molecules of B at equilibrium is greater than the number of molecules of A. We quantify this using the equilibrium constant, saying that the ratio of the concentration or number of molecules of B to the concentration or number of molecules of A is greater than one in this case. There are two important equations built into this model. The first is the definition of the equilibrium constant as the ratio of the concentrations of products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the concentrations of reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, all at equilibrium. And the second is the relationship between the equilibrium constant and delta G. And this is an exponential relationship. K depends exponentially on delta G. So small changes in delta G can lead to large changes in the value of K. What we ultimately want to be able to do for organic reactions in equilibrium is reason qualitatively from organic structures, specifically the structures of reactants and products, to a qualitative assessment of the delta G value. Primarily, is it greater than or less than zero? And how positive or how negative is it? Is it much greater than zero, much less than zero, or relatively close to zero? Our key conceptual tool for doing this will be the stability trends. In fact, we've already talked about the relationship between stability and free energy. And so by recognizing the stability factors and how they affect the energies of reactant and product molecules, we can make qualitative assessments of delta G like this. You'll start seeing multi-step reaction mechanisms, including relatively complex structures in your organic chemistry courses. And so at this point, it's important to talk about what equilibrium looks like within reaction mechanisms, even mechanisms for reactions that are irreversible or complete as a whole. Even for these reactions where we wouldn't expect things to be in equilibrium until the reaction is complete, until all of the reactants have converted to products, a series of steps within the mechanism can still be said to be in equilibrium. And the key condition here is that those steps are rapid. They have very high rate constants and they're relatively rapid relative to other steps in the mechanism. We say that these steps are in equilibrium. And as a model of this, for example, if we started with some reactants R, and those reactants were converted rapidly into an intermediate I, which then converted relatively slowly into a product P, we could say that R and I are in equilibrium throughout this reaction, even when R hasn't been completely converted to P. And we can, for example, write and use the equilibrium constant for this conversion of R to I in writing the overall rate law for the reaction and in thinking about how it works. Most importantly, we can use the molecular model from the last slide to think about R and I and their relative numbers of molecules and things like this. One of the nice things about this is that we can then make a qualitative guess about the relative amounts of R and I within the reaction mixture if we can make a qualitative guess about the free energy difference between R and I. This can be useful, for example, in ruling out multiple possibilities. If the conversion of R to another intermediate is unreasonable on thermodynamic grounds, in other words, the other intermediate is far less stable than R, then we can rule it out as a possible intermediate along the reaction mechanism. You'll find yourself doing this kind of reasoning a lot. Realize that it's based in thermodynamics and the assumption that relatively rapid steps like acid-base reactions are in equilibrium as reactions occur. One last thing to mention is that if a reaction as a whole is in equilibrium, in other words, it's so rapid that under normal laboratory circumstances or in the context in which we're working, it's reached equilibrium, all of the elementary steps involved in the mechanism of this reaction must also be in equilibrium. So we might even have multiple intermediates formed through a series of elementary steps 
let's say there are three here so that we have three intermediates leading to a final product P through a fourth step, all of the steps along the reaction mechanism pathway are in equilibrium with respect to each other if the reaction as a whole is in equilibrium, as we've shown here. This means that the entire distribution of molecules, R, I1, I2, I3, and P, can all be thought of using the tools of chemical equilibrium, namely the equilibrium constants for each step, capital K1, K2, K3, and K4, and of course the free energy differences between each pair of molecules, R and I1, I1 and I2, etc., etc. For entire reactions or elementary steps within reactions that are in equilibrium, it's all about the value of K and the value of delta G. And as you'll see, we can make good qualitative guesses about the values of these numbers using the stability factors that we've already discussed.